Order. 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 Honorable members, I've been informed by the Whipari that they have agreed that there will be no motions without notice or notices of motion. I would like to take this opportunity not only to welcome the Deputy President, but also to ask him to come to the podium and to let us begin with the questions as per our order paper. <laughs> Deputy President, you are welcome. The first question is question number seven, which was posed to you by the Honorable Zamin. You're welcome, sir. Thank you, uh, Chairperson, Honorable Members. I have been assured by the South African National AIDS Trust that the organization has a fraud prevention policy as well as a code of conduct. These instruments regulate and they also prevent fraud and malpractice the Sanak Trust also has an audit and risk committee which was set up to deal with all these matters that have to do with compliance. The committee has an obligation to report any form of malpractice and fraud allegations to the entire trust or they can escalate matters and report these to another structure, which is more of a state structure, the master of the Supreme Court. The trust deed supported by the Trust Property Control Act holds the trustees and all of them responsible for acts of fraud or dishonesty Recently, the trust introduced a system which requires members to sign a declaration of interest. This will further reduce the likelihood of conflicts of interest, and we trust and hope that this will also prevent fraud. In addition, all suppliers and contractors are managed through the supply chain management system that they have, which requires additional disclosures from all SANAC employees involved in the procurement of goods and services. Suppliers are also required, Chairperson, to disclose relationships, if any, with SANAC and other government entities. We welcome the appointment of Dr. Sandy Lebutelezi as the Chief Executive Officer of the Trust. Dr. Butelezi is a seasoned public health practitioner with more than 15 years experience in program development and management in public and non-profit sectors. He was the one person who was involved with others in the establishment of the first ever provincial AIDS council in KwaZulu-Natal, where he also played a leading role in the conceptualization of the now renowned OSS program, which is Operation Suguma Saake. This Operation OSS has become a best practice model now, which is being replicated by a number of other provinces after they saw its efficacy. With this broad and diverse local and continental experience in HIV and TB management, Dr. Butelezi, the new CEO, is expected to drive the implementation of the National Strategic Plan, which was adopted in March this year. With his appreciation for the strength of the multi-sectoral response, Dr. Butelezi is expected to work closely with the civil society and development partners to deepen collaboration whilst continuously building capacity 
of the civil service organizations. I hope that honorable members will share our confidence that SANAC is well governed and well placed to successfully drive our national aid response in a collaborative way as it has always sought to do. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Deputy President. The Honorable Lamini, your supplementary. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Mbonga Kusagela Manga Mailuelive, Upendulene, follow up question. Thank you, Chair. Deputy President. I thought Ute Seng Pendule. Sorry, Chair, through you. Nitsi Nineti Segile, the Bendolo Dake, Upendole Nale Bendo Yenda is a supplementary question. Thank, Thank you, Deputy President. It seems you are not required to respond to anything. The Honorable Mguebu. Deputy President, I am sure you'll agree that replacing a competent and effective official with a controversial one who has a dark cloud hanging over his head is a negligent approach to corruption. I'm saying this because the former <coughs> SANAC CEO, Dr. Farid Abdullah's contract has not been extended despite the fact that he's the one who built Sanak from scratch into an effective enterprise. And this has made him to be targeted by the colleagues at Sanak for refusing to let them abuse the organization for private gains. Deputy President, you're telling us now that you have replaced him and appointed Dr. Sandile Butelezi. Let me tell you another side of Sandile Butelezi you haven't told us. He has a controversial and a questionable past as the, as the new CEO. And I'm saying this because in 2008, when he was the head of the HIV AIDS in KZN, various allegations of corruption have been leveled against him by stakeholders and NGOs as, at the time when he was presiding as the head of the HIV AIDS in KZN. He was also involved in the rollout and the use of unsafe plastic circumcision device called the Tara clamp, which caused fatalities. Honorable Mgwebu, please take your seat. Honorable Kaula, why are you standing? I'm standing on a point of order, Honorable Chairperson. Yes, sir. I wish you could attach a name to this Dr. Ptilis. Um, Honorable Mgwebu, please. Um, I think Honorable Julius has done the honors. He has attached the name. Please proceed. Thank you. Uh, my apologies, Mr. Dr. Ka Mr. Kaula. Honorable Kaula. Dr. Sandy Labutele is a controversial and a questionable past. Various allegations of corruption have been leveled against him by stakeholders and NGOs when he was the head of the HIV AIDS in KZN. Dr. Sandy Labutele was also involved in the rollout and the use of unsafe plastic circumcision device called the Terra Claim that caused fatalities, Deputy President. Now, Deputy President, if you're serious about rooting out corruption, uh, truly, as you, you say, and that uh, you believe in good governance, as you have always claimed, how can a man with this questionable and controversial past be appointed to this position of the CEO? And if these allegations that were leveled by credible organizations like a treatment, you know, a treatment action campaign and other NGOs were never followed, Honorable now that I'm Mugabe. raising them, will you follow these allegations and give us a report with the findings thereof Thank you, and recommendations sir, your time has expired. to ensure that this matter is investigated and properly uh, you know, resolved. Thank, Thank you. you. The Honorable Deputy President. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, raising these issues. I mean, these <laughs> clearly are sharp and pointed issues. Uh, let me just uh, outline the processes that have been followed. The contract that Dr. Farid had with uh, a CEO of Sanak Trust came to an end, and the trust had to deal with whether they should extend, well, whether they should renew the contract. And of their own volition in discussing this matter, they decided that they would like to open the opportunity up to a number of other uh, applicants. And indeed, there were quite a number of applicants. Uh, Dr. Farid was interviewed, as well as Dr. Ptelezi and others. 
And in the end, the trustees themselves felt that they should appoint Dr. Boutelis. Now, what you are outlining is something that is not known to me because I'm not a trustee uh, of uh, the, the, the trust. They would have dealt with these matters themselves as a trust. What they then do is to uh, report to myself as a chairperson of SANAC. What you've uh, outlined and uh, disclosed was never brought to my attention. In fact, it is the first time that I'm hearing of all this. The profile that we had of Dr. Butelezi is what I outlined in my initial answer. So what you have put forward is something that I would certainly like to look at. We will examine all the details that you have put forward and I'll discuss it with the trustees uh, of the Sanak Trust and we will then take the matter forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. The Honorable Muhat. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Deputy President, with regard to the same matter of the CEO, the new CEO, Mr. Butelez, there's been allegations from the various civil organizations that are intending to withdraw from SANEC. What is it that the Deputy President is going to do to ensure that all stakeholders that are participating fully within the SANEC are really contained for the betterment of addressing issues of HIV out there, which remains a challenge in our county? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Deputy President. Thank you, uh, Chairperson. As we all know, SANAC is a collaborative uh, undertaking or institution uh, in which is involved a whole range of organizations from government through to non-governmental organizations, trade unions, sporting organizations, you name them, they are all there. So it is a very wonderful example of true collaboration uh, in our country, which deals with a very vexing matter, which is very uh, high on the profile or on the agenda of our country. So what we will be doing is to discuss this matter within the Sanak family. Now that it has been raised, we will take time to discuss it. And the treatment action campaign colleagues, uh, as far as to myself, never raised it in the detail that it has now been disclosed. And indeed, we will be able to sit down with them and whoever else has information in this regard. But we will, for all intents and purposes, always seek to see Sanak united, even as we will be dealing with a very complex matter that has to deal with the issue that has now been raised. So my job as chairperson of Sanak is to keep the integrity of the unity of Sanak intact and make sure that as we address difficult matters, we always focus on the task that we have at hand. We will do so. Thank you very much. The Honorable Mukwil. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and thank you very much, uh, Deputy President, for your response. But um, I would like to check with you, President, that yes, we acknowledge as the EFF, we acknowledge that there is this um, conspiracy that is running um, about your private life and you being a a public person, um, we know that this conspiracy that is running, it's, it's obviously because of the contestation or the conference of the ANC that is coming on our way. Now, my question to you, uh, Honorable Pre Deputy President, is that what do you think will be the impact on your personal uh, of your personal controversies on your effective leadership of SANEC. What will this personal controversies that is running about your name will affect your performance as a chairperson and the leader of SANEC? Thank you very much. Deputy President, the question, the principal question is around the issues of corruption and measures that are in place to deal with SANEC. 
you are within your rights if you wish to take this personal question, but it, that supplement is not a supplement that arises from the response that you gave to the primary question. I'm going to leave it up to you, sir, but you are not forced to respond because it's a completely different <coughs> question. I'm happy to respond to the question. I did say in the National Assembly that I would be uh, dealing with this matter uh, in a day or two. Having said that, I was then uh, counseled by quite a number of leaders within our movement and including structures at the lower level, uh, at the provincial level and at regional level. And they said to me, Deputy President, when you address this matter in the West Rand, you said you take responsibility for your actions and you're taking accountability. And uh, they said, you even said you've discussed it with your family, with your wife. And they said, as far as we are concerned, that matter should rest there. And do not, we do not believe you should take it any further. And indeed, when I raised the matter in the National Assembly, there were quite <laughs> noises that were raised where people in the, members in the National Assembly said, not here. We do not want this matter discussed here. So basically, the type of response I have received, having said that I take responsibility and uh, I've discussed this with my family, with my wife, and we've uh, discussed it to a point where we have uh, reached uh, a level where there is understanding, and I've taken full responsibility for that. Now, having done that, I'm also having to listen to my own organization, to the structures within my own organization and to the membership of my organization. And what I have gained quite clearly is that this matter is a private matter. You continue doing what we would like you to do uh, in relation to our organization. So, in relation to the work that I'm doing uh, for SANAC, I do not see this as affecting the work that I'm doing, I've been given a responsibility which I'm executing to the best of my ability. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy President. The, the second question is question number eight. It was posed by the Honorable Davuskarn, Deputy President. Honorable Chairperson, South African Airways debt of approximately 6.8 billion rand, which matures on 30th September 2017, will be resolved through a two-pronged approach. Firstly, any funds being considered will have to be appropriated through the special appropriation bill which will in part assist the airlines working capital and repay some of the maturing debt. SAA is also negotiating with its lenders to extend maturing debt beyond the 30th of September 2017. The precise makeup of the quantum of extension of debt and repayment of part of SAA's maturing debt will be announced by the Minister of Finance and the South African Airways Board at an appropriate time. At this stage, therefore, there is no need to invoke Section 16 of the PFMA to support SAA. On the matter of monies owed by SAA, by the Angolan government, the position is that the new government in Angola has indicated that it will settle this debt. I thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you, Deputy President. The Honorable Labuskafni. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Deputy Chairperson, for the feedback. Uh, as you said, uh, the, there should be a special appropriations bill Unfortunately, Deputy President, you and I know and all of us know, up till the 30th of September, it's 
absolutely not possible to pass a bill like that. Then, apart from that, there are reports that NetBank refused the rollover of the debt, as well as chartered, is a standard, uh, standard Chartered Bank and Citibank, because of the involvement of uh, Dudu Mayeni. And Minister Malusi Gigaba has previously indicated that she will stay there in the position until the AGM. And we all know that according to the regulations, the AGM must be held before the end of this year. Now, Deputy Chairperson, in your capacity as the Chairperson of the Interministerial Committee on the SOE Reform, will you step in and remove Dudu Mayeni as her continued employment prove to be a massive liability to SAA because it's all these loans that has to be paid as well as penalties, most probably? And if not, why are you yet again unwilling to act in the best interest of this country rather choosing to once more protect the ANC political elite in this case. Thank you, uh, Deputy, uh, uh, Chairperson rather. Thank you, Chairperson. <laughs> I'm accustomed to deputies because I'm a deputy. <laughs> uh, Chairperson, the matter of appointment of chairpersons of SOEs is a matter that is dealt with by the cabinet. Cabinet deals with these matters, and as it turned out when the board was uh, reconstructed, uh, it was cabinet that dealt with this matter. So I would say that we should leave this matter to cabinet to deal with. Uh, the IMC deals with broad policy matters, that's the IMC that I chair as deputy president. It is, deals with broad policy matters that have to do with, with uh, the appointment <coughs> policy of the boards. We do not deal with the specific names of people who should be appointed. That is left to the cabinet to deal with. So I would say much as the matter has been raised in the way that it has, it should then be left to cabinet to finalize. Thank you, Deputy Chairperson. Thank you, Deputy President. The Honorable Kaula. Uh, honorable uh, President. Deputy. Deputy President, oh, thank you. <laughs> honorable Deputy President. Nyabo. The SAA has been a continuing problem for South Africa for as long as one can remember. Every year, for the past whatever years, these bailouts keep on coming back and coming back and coming back. Now, it means as a country, we keep on falling on the same spot every year. Now, as South Africans, we would like to know what other progressive strategy can the government have to ensure that SAA does not become a liability even to the future generations of this country? Because you know this thing of every year the same problem keeps on coming back. It talks to the kind of leadership we have at the SAA. It talks to the kind of leadership we have in the country. It talks to the leadership we have in the IMC, the chairperson himself. Now, what other strategy does the government have to can be able to take us out of this dilemma, Honorable President? Thank you, Chair. <laughs> the Honorable Deputy President. Thank you, Chairperson and Honorable Kaolang. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the issue of the SAA is, is, is a very complex one. SAA is a 100% owned state uh, company and it's operating in a very difficult market. Airlines around the world are not your most profitable type of uh, entities. The sector is a very competitive one and uh, many have uh, faced headwinds and difficulties 
in terms of uh, becoming profitable and getting out of the difficult situations that they are in. Right now, SAA is right there, facing headwinds and great difficulties from an operational and profitability point of view. In the past, it operated well and made profits, and right now, it is facing great difficulties and needs the bailouts that uh, the, the, only the government can give it. Now, from the IMC point of view, we have been looking at processes and policies that can enable our state-owned enterprises to operate better. First thing that we looked at, uh, which I think is covered by another question which I can address now, is how best the boards can operate and how best management can operate and how the financial uh, uh, stability of those entities can be uh, upheld. Now, our belief and our strong belief in this regard is once you can position the board and empower the board and get good management to run the company, you are going to be in a much better position. And this is precisely what we are doing right across the various state-owned enterprises. Having set out the policy, we are also looking at how the balance sheets of these companies can be better managed and how the financing, those that need financing, can be better structured so that they are not driven into uh, bankruptcy. So that is what we are looking at. And we need time to be able to do that. And let us remember that these entities have two mandates to fulfill. The one mandate is a developmental mandate, and in SAA side is to make sure that it boosts the tourism prospects of our country. And tourism is a big sector of our economy that is creating a lot of jobs and from a tourism point of view, South Africa keeps on seeing more and more tourists coming here. So we need to leverage the position of SAA to boost our tourism uh, sector. And that may look like a difficult task, but that's exactly what we are involved in. And the other one, which is a, an important mandate, is that they must be, become profitable. So you have a clash of these two mandate requirements, developmental as well as profitability. And it's a very tricky task to balance the two. But because they are state-owned, we expect them to balance both of them, to be both developmental and also to become profitable. And I can assure you that the efforts that we're putting in place are meant to achieve precisely both. And we are sure that we will get SAA into profitability going forward if we do all the things that the IMC is focusing on. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Deputy President, the Honorable Faber. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Good to see you in the House, Mr. Deputy President. Um, I just wanted to know, are there any penalties and fees to be expected from the loans maturing on the 30th of September 2017? Deputy President? As the loan industry works, there are always uh, things like interest as well as penalties that one needs to, to face up to and to negotiate. You have to negotiate your way around that. And uh, once the covenants have not been properly met, you can expect that there could well be. In this case, I do not have the specific details of uh, the type of uh, penalties that could uh, be part of this whole process, but uh, that obviously is dealt with by the financial people as they crunch the numbers and look more closely at uh, the impact of the loans, because some of the loans have different maturity dates, and you've mentioned one, there could have been you know, sub-loans or subordinated loans that could have uh, slightly different maturity dates as well. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you, Deputy President. The, on, the last supplementary goes to the Honorable Shabangu. 
Thank you, Chair, Deputy President. Under no condition or circumstances must government uh, stake at Telcom be sold. Telcom is an example of what can be achieved if, with SOEs if the people appointed are not corrupt and uh, compet uh, competent. Telcom is profitable. Honorable Shabangu, are you on SAA or on Telcom? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That is SOEs. That is what we expect from SOEs. <laughs> when the cabinet reappointed Ms. Dudu Nyeni, a chairperson of South SSA board in August last year, it was uh, for a year. The fact that she's still the chair of SAA has proven to be illegal. Given that cabinet was not uh, consulted, who appointed her? What will be the repercussions for illegal appointed appointment? What measures will we take? Will you take a deputy president? And what measures should be taken to ensure that our appointment is me immediately terminated? Thank you. Deputy President. Thank you, uh, Chairperson. I did address this matter earlier and said that in the end, cabinet deals with these matters. And uh, uh, so cabinet will address this matter as it always addresses matters of appointments of board members to state-owned enterprises. So this is one of those that cabinet will have to apply its mind to. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Deputy President. Before we proceed, I just want to, um, honorable members, to tell you that we are very honored today. We have three schools from around Cape Town, the Dominican School for, from the, for the Deaf from Weinberg is here. We also have the Delabat School for the Duavas from Worcester. We also have Nolutando School from the Deaf from Kayelicha. You're welcome, my children. We must also say that we are very happy, Deputy President, that Dr. Vauda, Honorable Vauda, is back. He is looking very well. <laughs> Deputy President, we proceed to our third question. It is a question posed to the Deputy President by the Honorable Chai. Uh, thank question you, Chairperson. Honorable members, in February of this year, the NEDLEC Social Partners reached agreement on the introduction of the national minimum wage, which was set and agreed to by the partners at 20 rand an hour. And this should commence on the 1st of May in 2018. Yesterday, the partners at NEDLEC met and finalized all the outstanding issues, which will be paving the way for the bill to be brought to Parliament for processing so that the workers of our country are then able to benefit and partake in the commencement of the national minimum wage on the 1st of May. A code, and other area of agreement was a code of good practice and an accord on collective bargaining and industrial action in which all social partners in NEDLEC committed to take all steps necessary to prevent violence, intimidation, and damage to property during industrial action. The accord also seeks to improve the capacity of the social partners and other agencies to enable them to resolve disputes peacefully and quickly. They also agreed on amendments to the Labor Relations Act, uh, which amendments will be tabled before Parliament, that aim to further strengthen collective bargaining and dispute resolution. These agreements have paved the way for the tabling to Parliament of the Labor Relations Act, so it will be coming. The introduction of a national minimum wage is intended 
to significantly improve the lives of the lowest paid workers uh, in our country. This is an important intervention amid, uh, aimed rather at reducing wage uh, poverty in our country. Having received the latest poverty uh, statistics, which were worrying uh, two weeks ago, this intervention, Madam Chair, is going to definitely help many, many people a great deal. Well over six million workers will see their wages increase to a minimum of 20 rand an hour, hopefully, en route to a living wage, which is still the objective that all partners have set themselves. Combined with strong collective bargaining and agreement on annual adjustments, we are confident that workers in our country will have their dignity restored. On the broader question of unemployment and poverty, government is intensifying the implementation of a number of interventions. And uh, we've put out a number of plans, and one of those, which is the nine-point plan, which is a major intervention by government, seeks to unlock the job creation potential of cooperatives, small and medium enterprises, revitalize rural and township enterprises, and to re-energize long-standing and greenfield sectors like the oceans economy. Our interventions in the oceans economy have unlocked, Madam Chair, significant investments that will create jobs. This initiative has attracted quite a lot of investment from the private sector. The Department of Trade and Industry is currently providing incentive support to the tune of almost half a billion rand for investment in ports, marine, manufacturing, and aquaculture. And working together with the private sector, we are finalizing plans for the employment in internships as well as in learnerships of up to one million young people, which should commence on a test pilot basis later this, month, this year. All these actions constitute a basket of interventions to reduce unemployment, to reduce poverty and inequality. And we're hoping that we should be able, as we have now come out of technical recession, to see further growth in our economy, and this will be greatly enhanced by the deepening of social dialogue amongst all the partners, business, labor, community, and government. We believe that we are well on our way to move South Africa forward. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. Thank you, Chair. The Honorable Chai. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson and uh, Deputy President uh, for the comprehensive response. Um, but recently, uh, recent figures by the state of South Africa indicate ma that many people, particularly in rural areas, uh, female-headed uh, households, uh, are living under poverty. Uh, government has announced many tools uh, to accelerate growth, uh, create jobs, eliminate uh, poverty and inequality. Uh, recently, uh, Honorable Deputy President, the Minister of Finance announced another package uh, of the 14-point uh, plan uh, to jumpstart uh, our economy with the aim to attract investment, uh, both domestic and foreign, and create employment, reduce poverty, eliminate uh, inequality. Uh, can the Honorable Deputy President give assurance that the government will be able to accelerate uh, implementation of all policy tools and shift uh, the economy to a higher gear? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Deputy President. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairperson. Yes, I can confirm that <clears throat> the government is now more directly focused on implementation. We've put out quite a number of plans. 14-point plan, the nine-point plan, and also in mining, the 10-point plan, we have put out a number of initiatives. And in many ways, one could say, isn't there a weakness in all that? There is no weakness in that. Each of the points of the plans that we have are focusing on specific areas. For instance, the nine-point plan. One of the areas it focused on was to stabilize the energy supply and generation in our country. That has been done, so we can tick that. And we also focus on agro-processing. 
And agro-processing is an important sector, or agriculture is an important sector in our economy. And we saw the delivery of uh, agriculture in the growth that we just had in the last quarter. Two and a half percent, and agriculture contributed quite significantly in there. It shows that our focus on agriculture, agro-processing, is beginning to bear fruit. We also focus on beneficiation, which is part of mining, and we saw how mining also increased productivity even under difficult circumstances, and that productivity had a contribution also from what the Nine Point Plan seeks to focus on. But the other important thing was in our Nine Point Plan we said we would want to uh, boost investment in our country, uh, and having focus on that, we've seen more and more investments coming through. So this is an illustration to say that as we announce these various plans, they should never be seen as just talk from government. These are meaningful initiatives that are meant to focus on specific areas that are able to move the needle and to move our economy forward. What is pleasing with what government is focusing on is that it identifies a problem and having done so, it comes up with a response. And the response quite often is an initiative or an intervention which is aimed at making sure that we get results. Are we getting results from all these interventions? My answer is yes. And in some cases, it will be slow. In the ocean economy, for instance, we are already seeing, beginning to see investment coming in. Having identified the ocean economy as an area that we need to focus on to unlock new economic opportunities. So that is a sector where there is growth. We also decided that we are also going to focus on promoting radical economic transformation by creating black industrialists. Are we creating black industrialists? Thus far, we've identified 46, and that has brought in billions of investment from the private sector with uh, initial contribution from the state. Small and medium enterprises, we're also doing a lot there. So the plethora of plans should never be seen as a weakness. It should be seen as a strength and should be seen as a process through which the South African government is responding to the current economic slump. So we are trying to do everything to move our economy forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy President. The Honorable Kony. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Today you are wearing a very progressive color, red. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. Uh, if my memory serves me well, it, it, you would agree with me that it has been a year since the National Minimum Wage a panel reported its recommendations to you. Uh, so, Babereki, Basanza, Baemi, Batlomema, Deputy President, uh, you announced the recommendations of the ad uh, advisory panel uh, and advised that the National Minimum Wage would be 3,500, and the EFF rejected that. So because it has been a year, uh, I, was, I, I want to ask you if uh, the amount still remains the same or because it has been a long time or at least it's going to be 4,500 like <laughs> the, we, the EFF would want it to be or more than that. Thank you. Deputy President. Honorable uh, Madam Chair, Honorable Kony, you'll be pleased to know that once we had crafted this agreement, we, and crafting it as a 20 rand per hour was quite an inspired move in that if you calculate the 20 rand an hour, which is what workers do, workers focus on what they get paid an hour. And as they work, some work eight hours, some work nine hours, and as a number of them work, they do their own calculations, and we found that in the main, 
the bulk of the workers would be getting around 3,900. Now, obviously, with overtime and uh, so on, that will be slightly more. Now, the one other important thing that the social partners agreed on is that there should be no erosion of the value of the minimum wage that they are going to earn when it is implemented. Now, when it is implemented, you, yes, you are right, it's going to be that 20 rand an hour, but embedded in our agreement is the ability to have a commission which is going to be set up, which is going to look at the efficacy of that amount, which is going to look at when and how it should be increased, taking into account a range of factors. Now, the good thing about this is that it is the social partners themselves who reached this agreement. It's not an imposed one. Business, labor, communities, and government bought into this. And this arrangement has now settled in the minds of many people in our country and is now being seen as a great opportunity. And in some cases, uh, working people see it as a historic moment in the life of our country that we now have a chance to lift some six million people, many of whom are earning way below, way below that 3,500. And there are some people, uh, Honorable Kony, who are still earning less than 1,000 rand a month in our country. There are some people who are still earning 500 rand a month in our country. So this momentous agreement is now going to lift six million people as the, the panel calculated. 6.6 .6 million people who are earning less than 3,500 will be lifted to the level of 20 rand an hour. And this is going to be a great boost, we believe to their own lives, and it's also going to be a great boost for South Africa to begin acceding towards a living wage. And many unions say this is a good beginning. And I think we should embrace it and applaud it as such, that it is a start. It is not the end. We now have a baseline from which we can give our people a decent living. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Deputy President. The Honorable Makue. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, to the Deputy President, we appreciate particularly the answer that you've given before, which relates to the minimum wage and also what is in the original question called low wages. Our responsibility as legislatures is to pass the law, but what we find is that in this instance, we may have many of the employers that find very creative ways of ensuring that they do not adhere to the legislation. And my question is particularly related to two sectors in the productive economy, which is domestic workers and farm workers. Can you tell us, Deputy President, what practical suggestions or what practical steps are considered to ensure that domestic workers and farm workers will benefit from this legislation. Thank you, sir. Deputy President. Uh, Honorable Chairperson, we did, as we crafted this agreement, all of us as social partners, realize that there were going to be two sectors that are going to face great difficulties. The one is the personal one, which is like domestic work, and the other one is going to be farm work. We've known historically that domestic workers in our country are paid the lowest wages. That we have known historically. And that continues and that persists. And domestic workers are also very difficult to organize because they work in our homes as individuals, hidden in our kitchens, in our homes, and with no one ever knowing what they earn. Now, 
Domestic workers in our country will now know, and let me say there has been a wage determination which has helped them a great deal. But notwithstanding that, we've also found that a number of employers have not been living up to the wage determination. But right now, with the minimum wage gaining traction, gaining popularity, we're hoping that individuals who employ domestic workers will be able to bring their level of wages up. Now, the same applies to farm workers. We have established tiers and given people who employ domestic workers time to live up to the final minimum wage. And we've said, yes, domestic workers, as I recall, would be paid at the level of, I think, 70% uh, of the minimum wage for a set period of two years, and thereafter, they should then accede to the higher level. So employers in domestic work are given an opportunity, time enough to prepare themselves to know that they will have to start paying the national minimum wage. And the same would happen with farm workers, which is at a higher level. Farm employers, rather, will need to pay uh, slightly lower than the actual minimum wage for a set period, and thereafter, they have to pay the national minimum wage. Now, one of the things that we've also agreed is that those employers who are not able to pay the national minimum wage can come and apply for an exemption. And this addresses itself to why didn't we set the minimum wage at a high level? We could have set the minimum wage at 10,000 rand. And if we had, many people would have lost their jobs. That's for sure. At 3,500 rand, some employers are saying, or 20 rand an hour rather, some employers are saying that it's going to be difficult for them. And we have said every employer who will find it difficult must come forward and apply for an exemption. The exemption process will go into examining uh, the difficulties that they have, and it will be set for a specific period. Thereafter, they will have to come back again. So this is to ensure that there is no mass loss uh, process in our country, that many of our people don't lose jobs, and that the Department of Labor will get involved in the process of giving exemptions. But that is also going to mean that the Department of Labor should sharpen its inspectorate. We should be able to ensure that there is full implementation of the national minimum wage. So the department is in the process right now of uh, getting inspectors employed, trained, so that by the time the national minimum wage is, uh, is put in place, we have an inspectorate that will be able to monitor it, to make sure that it is applied and properly implemented. Thank you, Chairperson. The Honorable Mohabi. President. Lehoja Muswao, now we make a motto, or Lake Aulanza Bufuma, Toke Amosevit, Leo Sali, Lekalikan. My Hokomiti, who aim we are Maplas, Iman versus Gon. Moba to Babona, Batla Tapuang, Bafuman Samosevit, Barita Sudilemo, Basa Lev Shui, Babi Leba Febua Gadi Jose Bodile. Kemo lights are offing. Motazamo President O Mata, O Lekango, O Leta Ho Romela, O Bai Bam Banzeva Yeza, Ketua Mufutoche and I Sutu, Ore Eskia Shola, Yeza Halavan, Kiba Aibaba Trobo, Navabato, Banzem Bapela, Bufume, Loja Muso, where make a mount, Kelevo. Kelevo Hamun Hat. Deputy President Murula Stulo, Rile Raiwood, what Aleo Yonae no, Yahore. Hunale Sibaka Mo Bat Bahai Su Basa Twarang Katila Ene Pahetzi. Rilera Kopa Department Ya Labor or Ike I Shabisi Tabaena. Kya Holo Batla Bante Bay Shabisis. Dual Asib Bonafe Labacherin Katila Yenu. 
ha re ntse ru ka re fumana hore go na le ba ba sebetsi ba bangata South Africa mona ba ntse ba tshwere ka thata ba phela ka thata ba hula ka thata mo ba sebetsa nteng jwale re re ha o kena moputso ona o mo tsha jwale wa national minimum wage go hloka ha lo re ba sebetsi bohle ba tsebe hore muso o beile molao o mo tsha e hlile muso o batla hore batho ba sebetsang ba a dule ba tseba ditokelo tsa bona ka bona go bohlokwa hore batho ba ha Yesu ha gologolo bana ba sebetsang ba dule ba ntse ba tsebe hore muso o ntse o tsama le bona muso o ikemiseditse o ba tshetse o ba tshireletse ho ntho o hletse mpe tse ba hiri ba ka dietsang ho bona jwale ke ho bona he hore ha ba tseba ditokelo tsa bona ba e tlahise pele ha di pictures a muso hore muso o tsebe hantle hantle gore go etsa halang mo ba sebetsang teng e hlile nthengwe bo hlokwa ke a gore ba ba ke ba leke gore ba fumane mekhatlo e tla ba emelang ka ba ne mekhatlo e mengata ka nnete e emelang ba sebetsi ka ba o feng ka ba o feng ha ba sebetsi ba ka tseba gore ntjo e ka ba tshireletsang lo feta ke gore ba be ditho tsa mekhatlo e shebaneng le di tsela tsa mesebetsi ya batho ba sebetsang e ka ba di plasing ka pa e ka ba mahaeng e ka ba hokae le hokae ke yona tshepo e re ka ba fang yona le molaetsa o o tshwantse hore ro fihlise ho bona hore ba dule ba tseba hore muso tsa male bona e hlile o batla hore ba tsebe ditokelo tsa bona ka ho fela tsona ke a le bo Deputy President, Honourable Members, we have been joined in the gallery by two important guests. It is the Deputy Speaker from Cameroon, Meli Faka. The Deputy Speaker from Cameroon. She is also Africa's candidate for the CPA chairpersonship. Thank you, ma'am. We also have the Honorable Okupa from Uganda. The Honorable Okupa is the treasurer of CPA Africa. You are welcome with your escorts. Honorable Deputy President, we proceed to question number 10. Question number 10 was posed by the Honorable Nguenya. Honorable Chairperson, <clears throat> Honorable Members, the government is currently involved in the process of reforming our state-owned enterprises. This process is led by the Interministerial Committee, which is chaired by the Deputy President. The work of the IMC is informed by the recommendations that were issued and indeed were issued by the Presidential Review Commission, Review Commission rather, and were accepted by government. Some of the recommendations that have been adopted include the finalization of the private sector participation framework for infrastructure delivery. The framework for the costing of the developmental mandate, the remuneration framework, as well as the guide for the appointment of persons to boards of these state-owned enterprises, as well as the chief executives thereof. Once these are fully implemented, I believe that our state-owned enterprises will be able to reclaim their role as the drivers of growth and development in our country. And this is a key objective that we have. We've got almost 720 state-owned enterprises in our economy, and a number of them are in the big category, and they should be playing a key role in the growth of our economy, and that is where we want to position them 
and reposition them, those who may not be doing that. According to the National Development Plan, South Africa can double its GDP by 2030 if state-owned enterprises work to their full potential. Now, this is the promise that is set out in our National Development Plan. This cannot be achieved unless we strengthen the governance of our SOEs, and to this end, the IMC will be submitting to Cabinet the second draft of the Government Shareholder Oversight Policy to clarify mandates and to regulate lines of accountability. The draft policy outlines the rationale for continued state ownership in the key sectors of the economy and make proposals for alternative ownership models. And this is clearly in line with the economic trajectory that we have chosen as a country to have a mixed economy, to have an economy in which the private sector plays a key role and in which the public sector also plays a role. As it is now, 70% of our economy is owned and driven by the private sector and 30% by the public sector. Now, what we need to do is to make sure that the public sector, as in our state-owned enterprises, functions so well as we transform our economy as a whole, as we transform and change the patterns of ownership, the patterns of control, and make sure that radical economic transformation becomes the order of the day. Now, implementing a new shareholder oversight model will be a radical change in governance and operation of our SOEs in order to be competitive, but more importantly, to regain investors and public confidence. And we know that the public has lost a lot of confidence in many of our state-owned enterprises because of the many things that have been happening therein. And our objective as an IMC is to make sure that our people regain that confidence. And we want our SOEs to have qualified and ethical boards and also have competent staff. The appointment of boards must follow a well-planned, formal and transparent procedure that will be applied across the different SOEs. Now, our target here is to promote transparency in the appointment of boards and to increase accountability and sound administration and good governance practices. But more importantly, Madam Chair, we want our state-owned enterprises to be well-functioning companies that are profitable and that will be delivering on their dual mandate, a developmental mandate as well as a profitability mandate. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. The Honorable Nguenya. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, Deputy President, I agree with you when you say the public has lost confidence in our SOEs because it is very clear what has happened with ESCOM when the uh, 7 billion rand, a contract of 7 billion rand was awarded to the Guptas without a tender. The same thing happened with Transnet when the Guptas and Duduzane Zuma earned 5 billion rand from a locomotive deal. I hope, Deputy President, that these guys for appointments of boards will help us get rid of people like Dudumieni who are killing the economy of this country. Governance has collapsed and looters are continuing to loot our money. And we have known this for well over five years, Deputy President. This morning, the National Treasury has drafted a special and urgent appropriation bill to recapitalize the SAA with the 10 billion bailout. How did this lawlessness, corruption, and collapse of government happen under your leadership, 
as the second highest leader in this government, Deputy President. Thank Deputy you. Deputy President. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairperson. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chairperson. You are protected, sir. Order. <laughs> Order, members. Order. As, as I was saying, we've identified the challenges that our state-owned enterprises face. We have done a full diagnosis. We know what the problems are and we are now addressing those problems. Some of those problems were clearly identified by the Presidential Review Commission, and we as the Interministerial Committee have now pointed them out more sharply and have now taken remedial action to come up with all these policies that I was talking about. And these policies and processes that we are proposing will be able to reposition our state-owned enterprises. And let me tell you that there are 720 or so state-owned enterprises. Many of them are functioning well. Many of them are functioning according to the book, and they've got good governance, good CEOs, and good boards. It is just a few. And it so happens that the few are the big ones and are the ones that have a greater impact on our economy and some of them, as I was saying, are operating in really difficult sectors of our economy. Notwithstanding that, we are saying we are addressing all those problems. We are addressing them to a point where we want, as I said, as we appoint board members, to have full transparency so that it is clearly transparent. We should know who is being appointed, what their capabilities are, their level of integrity, and their ability to add value to our state-owned enterprises. That is the architecture that we are putting in place. And it's an architecture and processes that we are confident will be able to reposition all these state-owned enterprises. Now, all I can say to all of us is that let us not lose hope. These state-owned enterprises are big and they are important in the lives of our country, and they are able to move the economic activity in one way or another. You look at Transnet. Transnet is so big, it's a multi, multi-billion rand company that moves the goods in our country right across the length and the breadth of the country. Now, it's important that it functions well. You look at ESCOM. You look at the capability of ESCOM when you travel at night and fly from north to south of South Africa and see the lights on, it is actually just a great wonder to see how, <laughs> to see how, as you're flying, to see how a state-owned enterprise is able to keep the lights on from Cape Town right to Limpopo. And, and, honorable members, I have always been, you know, blown by this. And knowing also that this one state-owned enterprise in developing its development, in executing its developmental mandate, has been able... Honorable Deputy President. <laughs> Please take thank your seat. you, honorable thank you, Chair. You know, order. You know, uh, honourable deputy president has been on point from the beginning. Is that a point? That of is order? why we didn't even say anything. But to say ESCOM is doing well, that is not the truth. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, That's not a point and of order. And the lights are not no. on in all the provinces of honorable South Africa. Honorable Mukwini, that true. is a point of Thank debate. You. That's not no, no, a point he's of answering, order. Take your seat. But he's answering questions. No, take your seat. Honorable Deputy President, please conclude. I may well be at fault. I may well be at fault, Honorable Mukwini, by, by, by uh, my, my own personal silly tendencies of being impressed by how one company is able to light up the whole country. And most of the time, and also to have succeeded in giving a 
85% of our people electricity. Honorable you know, Deputy President. I, I can promise you that you don't get that on our African continent. This is a company that we need to uphold. We need to encourage to do the best that it can. And this is what we should do. And all I ask for is that let us not, by what we say, what we do, drive ESCOM into the ground. Thank you, Deputy President. Thank you. The Honorable Khaila. Order. 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 Honorable Khaila is on the floor. Honorable Khaila. Mongameli ngeba and the Funu Kwabela in the Bayobanga Kwabi Rubana Wes Yana Zamilal Kelet and the Palele or Kumba upon Shala Ko. So and the Kwas go Kabe. However, <laughs> Deputy President, does the government have a practical plan that is currently being implemented with intentions to strategically place state-owned enterprises as anchors of fundamental economic transformation that benefit the largest section of our historically and current marginalized people of South Africa, in particular those in rural areas. A plan that ensures that rural poor is benefited from pro programs of driven by true the entities. As some of these entities are currently finding expression in metropoles and urban areas. If so, what are the relevant details of, and if not so, why not? Thank you, sir. Honorable Deputy President. Honorable Chairperson, yes, we have plans, plans that we're seeking to execute through our state-owned enterprises, and it is precisely why I was talking about two of those state-owned enterprises. And the mandate they've been given is a dual mandate, as I was saying, a developmental one, as well as a commercial profitability one. And what we want to see them do is to balance both. But also, we're seeking to focus on how they can be assisted to execute their developmental one. Now, you correctly say, for instance, with the electricity generation one, it hasn't covered the whole country, and that is true. And we, as we interact with them, keep on saying there is the 15% or so of the South African landscape that is not yet covered where there is still no electricity, and we want you to go there. We want you to execute that developmental mandate so that in the end, you have 100% coverage now, they seek support from the government, and we give them support, and that is why the support that we are extending to them is to strengthen them, to strengthen them, and at times, it means strengthening their balance sheet. At times, when they are in difficulties, we look at how we can, because in our view, they are just too big to fail, and they are just too important to our developmental agenda to fail. And that is why we don't want them to fail, and we seek ways of giving them as much support as we can. Now, are they executing the developmental mandate in our rural areas and in the urban areas where our people live? We would say yes, but they can do more. And it is this more that you are talking about that we want them to do. We want them to, to inject more energy to inject more enthusiasm in everything that they do to give our people a better life. And remember that our overall objective is to make sure that we improve the lives of our people in South Africa. And through these entities that the government owns and controls, we want to be able to do precisely that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, sir. The Honorable Pakis. Good President, on the basis of what you, you said in response to the question, and given the amount of material resource, and in the context of government priority of job creation and trajectory of economic development and growth, using our 
WHO is a powerful device. In your view, are we succeeding to create and build what I call pantisocracy in our society, given the hostile global environment dominated by capitalism? Thank you. Deputy President. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. We have always been mindful that South Africa is not an island. We operate in a globalized environment and where we've got to live side by side with uh, uh, a number of other big players dominated by capital, capital which always is on the lookout for the big bucks and, and profit. And we have chosen to chart a developmental path which is in many ways slightly different from what a number of those entities would want to see us charting. And in all that, we've always believed that we've got to be smart. We've got to be innovative, we've got to be uh, forward-looking, and we've got to have a clear vision of where we want to take our country. And as we execute our mixed, mixed uh, economy uh, trajectory, We've always known that there will be times when we rely on capital to achieve our objectives, but we must do it on terms that are more favorable to our country and our people. And there will be times when they will <coughs> seek to get much more from us than we, they would want us to get from them, and that is something that we've got to be wise about and be able to navigate our way around, because we live in a world where capital dominates quite a lot. Uh, it's a capitalist controlled type of world, and we must find a way of making uh, headway uh, within that milieu, within that type of environment that has been existed. And so far, I think we have done relatively well, and we focused we focus on advancing the interests of our people, and clearly we can do much more than that. We can do it much more vigorously and focus on improving the lives of our people, but I think we have not done too badly uh, as we've navigated our way through the maze. I mean, for instance, if you look at the availability of capital, who has capital? It is the capitalists of this country, of this world. And we must seek ways of using that capital to advance the interests of our people. And yes, in our country, who has capital? It is largely a minority. And the wisdom is to be able to use our leverage, our leverage which is based on what we are able to control and what we are able to gain from the control we have of the state, the state apparatus, to, to gain, uh, to make headway within all that. And if we focus on advancing the interests of our people and making sure that we get our people into ownership and control uh, processes or seats, that in itself uh, would be a great achievement. And we have a lot of countries that we can learn from. Uh, China is a very good country where we can learn because they have utilized the size that they have, the resources they have, but they have been able to navigate their way uh, within a capitalist control world, and they've been able to build strong and very, very effective state-owned enterprises, which is what we seek to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. The Honorable Faba, you are the last. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Deputy President, during your address in Kimberley the past weekend, you highlighted the state of South Africa's economy and said that the ANC and the country are in the need of new leadership. Now, I can't agree with you more, Deputy President, but definitely not ANC leadership. It is clear that, as you yourself, yourself said, you should not be spending time in factional policies and backstabbing each other, as we currently do, as we have more than 9 million people with our jobs in South Africa. This is also what you said. But now... 
You then even went further to say that the ANC exists to improve the lives of all people and not just certain people. And again, I could not agree more. But then came the best part when you admitted by saying, and I quote, Currently, we put friends and family in certain positions. And when they mess up and steal money, there is nothing we can do. Close quote. Now, Mr. Deputy President, if you yourself as President, Deputy President of our beloved country admit this at the Northern Cape ANC gathering, will you today in this house, in your official capacity, condemn the state capture of SOEs and blatant corruption by the Guptas and stand against premiers and ministers in cabinet connecting to the Gupta family who are looting the public coffers of state-owned entities Honourable and Faber. also influencing appointments. Honourable Faber, you. order members. Honourable Faber, you do know that you are taking territory because you are introducing a completely new question. It does not arise from the, this, except that in the very last part of your, your question, you inserted the word SOE. Deputy President, yes, I've been listening very carefully. You do know that. Deputy President, you are at liberty to ignore that whole. <laughs> it, is, it is his uh, choice. Thank you, Madam Chair. The, the position I have taken publicly on issues of uh, state capture is known. And uh, I, am, I remain firm on that, that the uh, resources of our country and indeed institutions of our country should be used to the benefit of the people of our country because they belong to them. And that applies to SOEs, uh, that uh, SOEs exist for no other reason but to advance the interests of our people. That's what they were set up for. So that is a clear message that I will, I will stand by at all times uh, because that is what we should all, as South Africans, be focusing on. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Deputy President. Deputy President, we move on to question number 11. The question was put to you by the Honorable Munagedi. Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Members, in 2010, the Human Resource Development Council adopted a five-point implementation plan. This plan identified key areas of focus to improve South Africa's poor skills by identifying areas such as how we can strengthen access, and uh, so that we can have quality education at our co TVET colleges. Also looked at how we can produce more artisans in our country who will be skilled as to be able to make a contribution to our economy. And how to produce a new generation of academics, thus creating uh, and strengthening industry partnerships, but also how we can strengthen and address the challenges that we continue to face when it comes to foundational learning, like your, your, your early childhood development, and also how we can look at this whole issue of worker education and how the state can play a role in the revitalization and focus on worker education. <clears throat> now, notable progress has been made towards achieving these objectives. On access to colleges, we have uh, seen a substantial increase in enrollments. This has doubled between 2010 and 2014. There has also been an increased focus on improving quality through addressing issues such as curriculum relevance, the staffing, as well as student access. The role of our CETAs in supporting workplace linkages has also been substantial. The number of TVET NASFAS beneficiaries has increased dramatically since 2012, thus enabling access for thousands of young people. Government has been hard at work to support the training of artisans. 
For example, the target for the period 2014 to 2015 was 65,000 artisans. And this target was exceeded by 5,000 and when we trained almost 70,000. In an independent study conducted in 2016, it was found, Madam Chairperson, that 79% of newly qualified artisans do find employment. The study further indicated that 58% of them find permanent employment with 23% in less stable contracts. Now, production of academics and creating stronger industry partnerships, the HRDC Council promotes the development of strong partnerships, and these partnerships themselves directly contribute towards a skilled, capable workforce to support more inclusive growth. In the initial period, a total of 125 lecturing posts were allocated to universities for mentoring, teaching, and research development, and we have seen that through this, we are resolving the low number of emerging African researchers due to financial challenges. Now, we as the HRDC Council uh, earlier this year visited the CSIR and we saw the fruits of the collaboration that can exist between industry uh, and our colleges. There we met new, we met young dynamic scientists who are doing groundbreaking research that will put our country in good stead to participate in the fourth industrial revolution. And on foundational learning, we are also doing a great deal. The worker education aspect is also being properly covered. And our skills revolution, Madam Chairperson, is well advanced. And we are confident that more will be achieved in coming years. And what the HRDC Council has sought to do is to ident identify gaps, challenges, and problems, and come up with very clear and clever ideas of how we can address this. And we often use academics who we ask to look more introspectively at any aspect of difficulties that we face. And we believe that we are on the way to addressing the skills challenge in our country. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. Thank you, sir. The Honorable Munagedi. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President, for that uh, comprehensive uh, response, which uh, indeed goes to the heart of uh, the challenges that we have to deal with as a country the triple challenges of uh, poverty, unemployment, and inequality. And uh, congratulate our government for indeed making sure that that strategy, strategy gets implemented to its fullest. My follow-up question is, how many TVET colleges have entered into partnerships with business institutions or organizations in order to develop or produce skills out there? And those partnerships, are they already yielding desired results. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Deputy President. Madam Chairperson, we have been seeking to get as many of our TVET colleges as possible to get into uh, these partnerships with various companies. In fact, uh, I've been encouraging uh, the adopt a TVET type of uh, intervention a great deal and encouraging companies, uh, not only those that exist near our colleges, but even those that may exist from far afield, to adopt uh, our colleges and to work well with our colleges. And this, and we're setting up the system much more clearly, and this is being done through encouraging collaboration and partnership between Tivet colleges as well as the companies that operate in the area. I saw how this works so much better with Sasol uh, in the Val area, where we encouraged uh, Sasol to be in close collaboration with our Tivet College there. And we found that they get involved uh, in, in, in the development of the curriculum. 
they get involved in the teaching, they also get involved in the practical side of helping the young people in our Tibet College uh, in the various processes that are utilized in Sasol. And they also draw them into the Sasol operations to go and be in the world of work. And this is where we have the happy medium of theoretical learning as well as practical learning that takes place almost simultaneously at the same time. Now this is the execution of what I've always admired, which is the German model, where people are given time to go and learn the theory and thereafter then get seconded to companies to go and do the practicals and then go back to do the theory and do it over a set time. And in many ways, that is how Germany has been a real industrial giant in the world because of uh, that way of being able to execute uh, the delivery of skills uh, in a very, very focused and practical way. I don't believe that it has a lot to do with federalism. It has a lot more to do with uh, how they focus on delivery uh, of uh, education and skills. Now, uh, you ask about the number of Tibet colleges. Uh, I don't have the number on my, my fingertips right now. However, all I can say is that we are continuing to encourage uh, companies to adopt these Tibet colleges. I've taken this up together with the Minister of Higher Education and Training as our pet uh, projects uh, as we go around the country to, to, to get our Tibet colleges to be adopted and to encourage that close relationship. And may I say as I conclude, where it is happening, we find that the young people who qualify from our Tibet colleges automatically get jobs without any fail. And wherever I go, I ask the principal or the chancellor of those colleges, they say they are able to place up to 89, 90-something percent of the young people who qualify. And this happens because of the symbiotic relationship between industry and our Tibet colleges. And it is for that reason that we are encouraging this adoption process to spread right throughout the country. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. Thank you, Deputy President. The Honorable Vauda. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. I greet you all with assalamu alaikum. Chairperson, thank you very much also for your kind sentiments expressed earlier. Uh, allow me also to um, uh, thank all the uh, honorable members as well as the uh, uh, parliamentary employees for the kind sentiments expressed during my, in my indisposition. I appreciate it very much and uh, it means a lot. Thank you. Through you, um, uh, honorable chair, honorable deputy president, uh, we, we sometimes seem to have too many point plans in place. There's a plan for this, there's a plan for that, and sometimes I, it reminds me of the past. I won't go there, but um, the question I would like to ask is, especially with regard, and we all of us appreciate that uh, 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 human resource development, two issues are fundamental. The, the issue of illiteracy and the I issue of uh, childhood development. The question I wish we wish to ask then is, what progress has been made since 2010 in ending illiteracy and achieving universal access to early childhood development, both of these being part of the human resources development strategy of South Africa? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, sir. Deputy President. The universal access on early childhood development has been growing by leaps and bounds in quite an admirable way. And in fact, I've actually been, you know, surprised at the level at which there has been uptake. And these early childhood development centers, some have been growing at an organic level where entrepreneurially driven individual South Africans have been setting these up and government having realized that these are growing by leaps and bounds has moved into the bridge to make sure that those who run these centers are brought into 
the system that we are setting up properly trained so that they can continue delivering that service. And, and we've also uh, set out what we would call your uh, standards, that if you want to run an early uh, standards and norms, if you want to run an early childhood development center, these are the standards and norms that you need to comply with. And thereafter, we've also been deploying quite a number of social workers uh, and people who go out and look at the facilities that have been set up. And no doubt, as you might have read in the press the other day, some have not been operating without proper permits, but they are becoming fewer and fewer, uh, fewer and fewer because having set up the standards and norms, we are then able to, to put them out there so that Whoever gets into this sector now knows that there is a proper government approved uh, system that they've got to comply with. Now, we've had almost 800,000 young people who are now in this system. And that is a lot of young people, whereas in the past we had some 200,000. Now, they've seen enormous growth and that has put a lot of stress on the sort of uh, social development uh, system, and we are focusing more attention on improving that. I have no doubt that we will see great improvement in the ECD sector uh, as uh, we, 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 we focus more attention and train uh, those who are involved in this sector uh, and develop a curriculum. Now, it, a curriculum has been developed to give training to people who want to get into this. And as I said, a number of them are entrepreneurs. They are the, the, you know, the women uh, in, our, in our society who are seeing an opportunity to look after young people in our country. And all this is aimed at eliminating illiteracy at a young level, and hence the standards and norms that we've set up. On the illiteracy elimination issue more broadly, I think our illiteracy levels, uh, e illiteracy levels have really gone down. Our literacy levels have gone up a great deal, and I think we are in the 80 percentages, whereas before we were much, much, much lower. So we're seeing a great improvement, and the programs that government implemented, Karigude uh, type of program, uh, is, was, was very good, and indeed it ran into some headwinds, but it has contributed a great deal. And our ABET, our ABET processes have also uh, contributed a great deal in eliminating uh, illiteracy. Now, we are living in a country where, in the main, education has become, you know, something that many of our people want to, to, to get. And you just see it with the number of young people who've gone into schools. The universal access that we now have in schools is well over 100%. And you now look at higher education, uh, the number of young people who are now in our college and university system is, has grown by leaps and bounds way beyond what we ever anticipated. And in a way, we've now become a victim of our own success in Thank that regard. And I'm sure that uh, <laughs> Honorable Mungo will agree. So. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the Honorable Mtedro. <laughs> Order. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Sagala Mengame, <laughs> for the excellent work that you are doing in, in our government. My, my, my question is, what is the contribution of the Transnet Marital School of Excellency training program in the production of graduates in the maritime industry? Thank you. Deputy President. The Transnet Maritime uh, 
College is uh, a college that I have focused some attention on because I once read uh, a story about that college which uh, made me pay more attention. I therefore had an introspective look at what they are doing and what they have sought to do is to train as many young people as possible in maritime studies. And you'll be pleased to hear that a number of the young people were also sent overseas to go and learn overseas. And a number of them are being trained here in the country. And they encountered a few difficulties which they have now sorted out. And that maritime school or college is now going to be functioning extremely well. The good thing is that many of our young people have seen the, 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 the oceans, maritime, as a great uh, area to get involved in. And this is in tandem with the focus that our government has placed on the ocean's economy. Because through that, they are able to learn uh, a number of disciplines in the ocean's economy. Would they be in boat building, in transportation, uh, in aquaculture, and in everything related to uh, the ocean's economy? So we see a great deal of potential even for young people in the maritime world. And being a country that is surrounded 3,000 kilometers by the sea, uh, we should take up this opportunity. In the past, uh, black people were by law, culture, everything, tradition, prevented from uh, gaining an interest in the ocean that surrounds our country. Now the opportunities are opening up. And I have reported in the past that as I've traveled on behalf of our country to various countries, I've often met young people who are involved in maritime studies. I went to Sweden, I met a cohort of young people who are doing their honors degrees. Oh no, no, master's degrees. I went to Japan and met a group of young people who are rearing to come back, who are also doing their uh, master's degrees. The same thing happened when I went to Vietnam. So we are spreading our young people uh, throughout the world. And clearly, our Transnet Maritime uh, College plays a critical role also uh, in ensuring that we increase the number of young people who should get involved in this. So the future is bright for our ocean's economy, and it is beginning to offer a lot of opportunities for young people. And when you meet them, I mean, you, you just see that you're meeting young people who are full of confidence, who are full of hope for the future, who want to come back and participate in the future growth of our economy. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. The Honorable Kola. Uh, Honorable President. <laughs> the, amongst the objectives of the Human Resource Development Council, it is to remove bottlenecks in the skills pipeline through the strengthening and support of uh, TVET colleges. Now, on the 3rd of May this year, the TVET Colleges Governors Council made a presentation to the Education Select Committee of the NCOP. Amongst other things, they are complaining about the following. Colleges are highly underfunded, and it is a miracle that none have closed doors so far. Funding is not commensurate with government policy. Since being handed over from provinces to national, colleges have been running on deficits. Funding made available to colleges by government covers only 62% of students. The last time the colleges were provided infrastructure grant was in 2006. As a result, infrastructure is collapsing. Learners, they pass their trades, but they do not get certificated or they do not graduate years after completing. Lastly, less than 20% of the total NSPAS allocation goes to the TVET colleges. The 80% plus goes to universities. Now, the question, Honorable Deputy President, how do we hope to achieve these objectives? 
when Tibet colleges are in this state of affairs. Thank you. Safety President. Honorable Chairperson, we are aware of all these problems and more. These are problems that we are addressing. The underfunding for Tibet colleges is quite acute. And the problems that you have alluded to, including certification, including uh, the assistance for studies, are all known problems. We are addressing them, and we are addressing them uh, within a, a, a system that is overburdened with the need for, for more funding. Uh, as it is now, the issues of fees for young people, not only in our Tibet colleges, but also in our universities, has had an overbearing uh, type of uh, burden on the whole higher education system. So these problems, including infrastructure, uh, but also including uh, accommodation, uh, hostels for these young people, are issues that are front of mind. They are right on our radar screen, and with the limited resources that we have, we are seeking to find ways to address them. The system is under a great deal of stress. The intention is to resolve all of them and to ensure that our young people who are in these Tibet colleges uh, get the best education. But this is happening uh, when the economy is not growing as much as we want to, when the revenue uh, is also shrinking, and when the demands for more funding to meet other needs and requirements is also at a high. So we are juggling quite a number of balls in the air, trying to resolve here and there. And remember, all this is happening as we have decided to build a few more colleges, but also to build three universities at the same time. And as you correctly say, it's in a way a miracle that many, in fact, all our colleges remain open. And I've been to some of them. I've walked around, spoken not only to the, the, the learners or the students themselves, but to the teachers, the lecturers, and I have seen the stress. And this is being addressed. I know that the Minister of Higher Education and Training spares no time uh, but address all these problems because they are key in his, uh, in, in his uh, top of mind. This is top of mind issues. And the real challenge is the resource base. The resource base is limited and he's had to try and juggle uh, a lot of balls in the air to address all these challenges. But they are being addressed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Deputy President. Deputy President, we are proceeding to our last question for the day. It is uh, posed to you by the Honorable Julius. Madam Chair, as I mentioned earlier, there are 31 recommendations in the report of the Presidential Review Committee on State-Owned Enterprises. These recommendations are being implemented by the IMC through a phased approach to, as guided by the February 2015 Cabinet Le Khotla, when we address all these matters. Recommendation 15 of the PRC report calls for the sanctioning of corrupt activities, including fronting by, amongst others, developing a register of delinquent individuals and companies that are involved in corrupt practices. It further calls for the sharing of this register across SOEs. Even though the IMC is yet to implement this recommendation, yet to implement it, along others as part of the next phase of reforms, there are ongoing anti-corruption efforts in our SOEs. In many instances, these are bearing fruit, hence the public reports, and outrage at all allegations of corruption. Our view is, however, 
uh, sorry, our view is whoever is suspected of wrongdoing should be brought to book without any fear, any favor, or any consideration. They should be brought to book. That is a firm position as far as we are concerned. I thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you, Deputy President. The Honorable Julius. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Thank you for the response, uh, Deputy President. But there are numerous examples of corrupt companies repeatedly doing business with SOEs in our country. ESCOM and Transnet have had numerous deals with Boat Trillion and uh, Regiments Fund. Uh, fund managers, both of whom have, have been linked to the Guptas and Anuj Singh. And the list can go on and on and on. Had this register been implemented in time, it is arguably arguable that these companies would, definite, would not have been able to get their tentacles so deep into our SOEs where they have systematically pillaged ever since. Now, even the commercial bank saw this and they said, no, we're going to freeze these accounts after being confronted with overwhelming prima facie evidence on these uh, SOEs and, and uh, these companies. Uh, that's linked with the Guptas uh, in South Africa. Now, Deputy President, you yourself said that you believe that the Gupta leaked emails are authentic. Can you go on record today that it is indeed authentic and why didn't you, if you have prima facie evidence, why didn't you act on it? Why do you have to wait? We have laws in this country. Why didn't you act on it? You yourself said it's authentic. Why are these individuals still walking around? Please start with the Guptas, the president, and his son, because you yourself said you have prima facie evidence. I thank you, Chair. Honorable Deputy President. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. I have been very clear on, on, on this matter, and I've said those institutions whose job it is to investigate these matters, to take these matters forward, should act. Now, we expect that they will act on whatever information they have, be it emails, be it other forms of evidence, uh, and many of these things have been spilling out into the open. Those are the institutions state institutions that have been put in place to deal with these matters. And we expect as South Africans that they will, as I said, without any fear or favor. Now, let us give them an opportunity and the chance to do their work. Because after all, they are accountable to us as the people of South Africa to do their work and to execute the mandate and the programs that they have. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. Thank you, Deputy President. The Honorable Khaila. He's struggling. Honorable Khaila. The IT people. There. Mongami. you are waiting for the presidential review committee on state entities. My question was then as it is now. Some of them have duplicating uh, duties. For instance, if you look at SAA, Mango, and SA Express, whereby the taxpayers of this country have to pay for three boards for failing entities. There are many more, like the Agricultural Bank, and you get don't do the, uh, that, and you agreed with me. But you said you are waiting. You agreed with me that uh, 
but you are waiting. Now, the question would then be, what are the recommendations of the presidential review on state entities? And uh, when will this, uh, these recommendations be implemented? Because it will save the South African taxpayers a lot of money. When are they likely to be implemented? It's over a year now. And what are the recommendations? When will they be implemented to save the taxpayers' money? We wouldn't have this problem with the Guptas if this was done. Can you please, I know you're a sincere person, you're going to be the president of the South Africa. <laughs> uh, as, now, can you please give us a proper answer? When will this be implemented for the sake of the taxpayers? Honorable Khaila, when did you become a prophet? <laughs> Deputy President. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairperson. So, would you bend the relaxed up and in? <laughs> Madam Chairperson, uh, absolutely correct that I did say that we would want the implementation of these recommendations and uh, uh, the, the issue that is being raised focuses on, for instance, the airline business. The government owns uh, all those that uh, have, been, have been identified. And as you look at all this, you then have three boards and uh, a number of other expenses that, that accompany that. Now, the, the Minister of Public Enterprises has been very vocal in saying that we are looking at how best we can rationalize uh, the aviation assets that the, the government owns. And in this regard, she's taken advice and there are a number of proposals that have been put before her. Those are being examined because if there is a way of rationalizing uh, and, and merging uh, our aviation assets in one way or another, we should be able to see whether we can gain more benefit and more advantage and reduce uh, wastage uh, from that. So that is being done. Now, obviously, uh, all of us would want everything to be done yesterday. I remember standing in this house when we were talking about the national minimum wage. There were honorable members who were saying that they want that minimum wage to be implemented five years ago, uh, as we were talking about it. Now that it's going to be implemented, they are no longer as uh, unhappy as, as they were. And, and similarly, <laughs> And similarly, uh, on this issue of uh, the rationalization of assets, we, we've been saying that where there is a need and a great benefit to be achieved in rationalizing some of the state-owned enterprises, we will. And where there's also a need to look at the state-owned enterprises in a way where there's duplication, where there is, uh, for instance, no need for some of them to continue being owned by the state, we will also look at those and come up with recommendations. Now, what we are seeking to do through this is to be smart, to be able to handle all this in a way that is going to increase the fortunes of South Africa, Inc. And if we're going to do that, we need to be dexterous and look at a number of initiatives that can lead us to that uh, good end. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. Thank you, Deputy President. The Honorable Kony. Kya le bo hamudula stilo? E kere motlatsa le khodule le tonna kere e askana tsela matla a le leme e botlho ka gore mahoko a Honorable Kaula Buang and a dulantse a i a i pheta a ka tswa ena nnete. Recommendation 15 of the report states very clearly on the, on the need to sanction corrupt individuals and develop a register for these people so that they are never again entrusted with the responsibility of leading state institutions. However, uh, DP, your own organization 
has been very hypocritical hip uh, in dealing with Gupta-inspired uh, corruption in our own state enterprises. So, like the uh, Brian Molefe was appointed despite uh, the public protector after uh, made, making the findings, serious findings against him. What are you uh, as the DP doing to ensure that our state-owned state enterprises are freed from the greed and influence of Duduzane's father and Duduzane's uncles being the, the Guptas? Thank you. Deputy President. Madam Chairperson, the recommendation by the Presidential Review Committee, 15 to be more specific, is very clear in, in what it seeks to achieve. And uh, its implementation in the end is going to result in, yes, these type of people. <laughs> Order, Honorable Mkwili. Honorable it's, Deputy President, please continue. Thank you uh, for your protection, <laughs> Madam Chairperson. <laughs> it's, it is going to result in a, a greater focus, really, on, on wrongdoers. Those companies, individuals, and entities that will be doing wrong things in our state-owned enterprises will need, yes, to be placed on a register so that it is known by all and sundry within the state sector that there w w should be certain people who have done wrong who we should, the state should not be dealing with. Now, that is going to be a fairly simple and straightforward process once that recommendation is implemented. We are in the process of implementing, implementing these recommendations, and I am sure that when it is finally implemented, the type of uh, talk that we are having here will be a thing of the past. And let us look forward to that day when all of us as South Africans will have really come to grips with the scourge of corruption within state-owned enterprises and we have a, f a more effective way of dealing with corruption. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. Thank you. The, the Honorable Lavaskafne. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Deputy President. Um, uh, as you said, uh, these implementations has to be phased in. That's seven years later, and the register, which is one of the main things to prevent corruption, has not been phased in yet. And you are referring to the institutions that should investigate this. Now, I want to put it to you, Deputy President, the slowness of which the government is handling corruption cases and uh, the state capture is shocking. And that great creates the impression that governments is more, government, government is more interested in and committed to self-enrichment than to help the people. Now, for instance, we reported the bell potting uh, case to the PRCA in July the on July the 2nd. By September the 5th, they had made, made a decision and they were expelled. In June, this parliament directed four committees to urgently probe allegations of state capture involving cabinet ministers. Up till now, nothing has been done. Now, my question to you, Honorable Pre Deputy President, is in your role, in your, as the Deputy President and as leader of local government business, of, of, of government business, don't you have a role and what do you plan to ask these institutions, why didn't you start the investigation, when are you starting to investigate, and what are you going to do to speed this up and make sure that we address this. Because while we are sitting in committees and having talk shops, these people are still looting and stealing the money and get away with it. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, Madam, <coughs> Madam Chairperson, the state institutions that uh, I alluded to, uh, as far as I'm concerned, are 
and they have said so publicly, uh, in the process of investigating all these matters. So the investigations are underway. Now, I think we need to allow that time to, 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 pro, to happen because they work in their own way and they don't work like a committee. They, they have to ascertain evidence. They have to, to get all the things that will support the allegation or the position that has been done incorrectly. So let us allow them the time and the space to be able to do that. And let us remember, these are public institutions themselves, and in the end they are accountable to the people of our country, and they know that the work that they are doing is being looked at quite introspectively by the South African public. So there are level of consciousness in terms of accountability is something that they, that, that will guide them in doing their work. So I have confidence that they will be able, as they have said so publicly, be able to investigate these matters and give us an outcome. Thank you very much, Madam Chairperson. Thank you very much, Deputy President. That was the last supplementary of the last question for the day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Madam Chairperson. Order. Thank you, members. Order. Order. Honorable members, we have had the privilege to have a young group of learners from Tsakani who call themselves Abacha Force of Change. You are welcome, my children. I also wish to express our gratitude to the special delegates from the Eastern Cape, the Free State, Hazelton, Limpopo. We want to thank you very much for being with us today. Um, are you raising a point of order? Sort of. You have the floor. Thank you, <coughs> Honorable um, Chairperson. I should have said this when you welcomed Honorable Bauda back. To this. And I really appreciate the way that you did it. But Honorable Chair, I would also like you back because, <clears throat> and I would urge you to look at yesterday's recording, which I regard is as my worst experience in a legislative assembly since 1999. I've never experienced such a gathering and I was really, um, uh, I, I felt I, I cannot be part of what happened here yesterday. And I urge you, to, to speak to the presiding officers so that what happened here yesterday never happens in this house again. And it was broadcast live and surely was a, a blot on the traditions and the decorum of this house. Thank you. I will do so, th sir. Honorable Kony, are you echoing the point? I don't want to put it that way. Just allow me the chance, but it's a point of order. It's not... I... Can you stand up on your feet? It's a point of order. Honorable Mukwili, is it the same point of order? So one of you will suffice. Because I'm going to recognize let me, let me one. Let me allow my whip, then if I'm not covered, I will ask for, for an opportunity to change. Okay. Yeah. Honorable Mukwili. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Actually, what Honorable uh, Hutting has alluded to you about the manner in which the presiding officers are running this house and making it to degenerate to a level where uh, members are treated unequally. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a concern for the EFF. We have been uh, writing you letters 
I think we are going again to write you the third letter to, to raise this matter because uh, generally this issue affects the EFF members uh, uh, 100% because... Uh, all the members. Honorable Chair. You are honorable, all the members. You are honorable protected. Chair, that's what yes. they were doing even yesterday when... I was afforded an opportunity to address the presiding officer. And then they were making noise and I asked for the protection of the presiding officer for her to offer me that protection. She chased me out of the house. So um, I'm appealing to you, Chair, and I'm humbly requesting. We, we have been uh, missing the deputy chairperson of the house, it has been long. The last time we saw him, we were, it was when we were on taking parliament to the people, yeah, yeah, we would gladly be That's informed no longer a point of order. Uh, by, your, by your kind office to locate, to locate no the deputy order, chairperson of this house. Thank you very much. Honorable members, the, the point of order which uh, Honorable Harting is bringing to my attention is being emphasized on by the Honorable Mukwili. I will look into the matter, I will look at um, the footage, I will also come back to this house and give a, a ruling on it. The, on, honorable members, is it really necessary, Honorable Pikes? You are afforded a chance? No, you have asked us to treat you all equal, honorable members. Honorable Pikes. It's very amazing that at the end of the day we have points of orders, but please continue. No. Chair, I'm not somebody who likes or relish, I do know, sir. Please. Uh, point of orders. But I want us to put what happened yesterday in context. And we're not sure what is the context and the content of Honorable Hutton from the DA? Um, what, what I want to raise, Chair, is what happened yesterday, it was inhuman to the Minister of communica what? Communica Administration. Huh? Public? Public Service. Look, Chair. Order. Oh, we must always be rigorous. We must always engage critically. We must always contest and challenge each other's capacity, whether intellectual capacity, the content-wise. But for members of this house to demean, undermine, to be specific, what happened from the side of EFF, to be specific, it was bad. I'm standing here to say it was bad and nobody can accept. We can be ugly, others can be so beautiful in this house, but if you engage me on the basis of my appearance, nobody can accept that. It's inhuman. It's inhuman, Chair. That's the point that I wanted to say. I'm not sure of the context, the content, I'm not sure of the context and the content, but what I'm saying here, I want to support him. It should never happen again. Thank you. Honorable members, I think we are agreed that I will look I will come back to the house. No, I don't want to take another can, point. Can I, we, with no, due respect? No, please take your seat, Honorable Mukwili. Okay, I will address it on the letter that I'm sub please uh, do submitting so. to your office. Please Thank do you so. very much. Honorable members, I just want to put it blankly. I will come back to the house. I will be as honest as possible. I will deal with all of you, if all of you are out of order, I will deal with it because it is in the interest of the dignity of this house. In having said that, I do wish to thank you all for your generally better behavior if I deduce from what the honorable members are saying today. This concludes the business of the day. Honorable members, you are requested to remain standing as we leave the house. The house is adjourned.